Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, hopefully, uh, we're going to have an exciting uh, program for you. Um, as you know, uh, the uh, recent uh, trials on low risk uh, Tavar versus surgery was. Uh, you guys can hear me on the back? Okay. I'll, I'll speak a little bit louder. Um, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to talk about the recent trials that, in my opinion, are going to revolutionize how we treat degenerative aortic stenosis. And hopefully we'll make it interesting by having a discussion between myself and uh, my surgical colleague, Dr. Ansevel, and my radiology uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Atkins. Um, before we start, um, I want to say a few things. I've been privileged to be part of this therapy for since it started at Innova in, I believe, late 2012, 2013. And I think I should uh, really mention Brian Raybach, who really was uh, instrumental in starting this program. Uh, he has moved on to better things now, but since we started, it was slow. It was a, a doubtful therapy to become mainstream. Uh, but six years later, I'm going to try to make the point that it is mainstream, and it will be mainstream. Um, before I also uh, go any further, um, I want to say that this week, I think we're going to do number 1,000 Tavor at the Nova Fairfax. So today we did. No, wow. I think you may have done one. Oh, I did it sure yesterday. So yesterday. I always do everything. But <laughs> so I guess uh, I guess yesterday was number thousand. Yesterday. Oh, yesterday or today, um, and it could not have uh, been done without a lot of work from a lot of people, some of whom are here. Uh, Russ, um, Tech Extraordinaire, or what is your title these days, Russ? <laughs> Uh, Annette, Paula, and everybody, and thank you for all you do. You guys really make the program work. Um, so I'm gonna, my, my portion is to try to make an argument that everybody should be considered for TAVR first. And of course, Dr. Antheville, who's uh, graciously uh, come over to talk, uh, the uh, contra uh, point to this is gonna talk about why surgery still has a big role. Having said that, um, to put a plug for surgeons I work with, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Saren, we almost always agree at the end because it's a teamwork. And this therapy has really brought cardiologists and surgeons together. It's not mine or yours, it's a teamwork. And uh, you will see that even though we're gonna try to make the uh, argument against each other at the end, uh, we do what's best for the patient and we're almost always in agreement toward the end. Um, let me make sure um, I didn't lose any other things before I start. My cheat sheet. And yes, and we have um, live stream, so if anybody is watching and you have questions, please put it up, and at the end of the program, we're gonna talk about it. So, talking about therapy, the therapy um, is about 10 years old, uh, at least in the United States, and the first therapy was looked at in people who were, who were too sick to have surgery. It was looked at between TAVOR versus medical therapy, and TAVOR clearly uh, was better. And in another cohort, it was also looked at uh, against surgery in people who were high risk for surgery but could have surgery, and TAVOR also did well in that population. We moved on to uh, intermediate risk. Those people whose mortality risk was calculated to be about four to eight. And uh, when uh, they looked at those patients in partner two and Sertavi, the Medtronic trial as well, these patients looked to be non-inferior to surgery. So the last group of patients that were unknown were people who had low risk, people who really should do fairly well with surgery. And the purpose of the two trials that were represent, uh, presented at ACC a few weeks ago uh, was to see if these patients do uh, as well with TAVOR or better or maybe worse. So the first trial was partner three. This was a, a trial that randomized these patients one to one to surgery and this is basically patients who, whose uh, risk of mortality for surgery was less than 4%. 
about a thousand patients were enrolled to either surgery or bypass or, or tabor. And the composite endpoint was mortality, stroke, and re, uh, hospitalization at one year. Uh, about 65 sites in the United States and a few outside. And uh, we were one of those sites at Innova. Uh, and uh, we enrolled briskly. We were not top 10, but we, we weren't too shabby either. Um, and this is basically the uh, um, endpoint, as I said. It was uh, looked for inferior, non-inferiority, and if it met that, it was also looked for superiority versus TAVO. Uh, and it was among all those patients who were treated. <clears throat> Sorry if I'm gonna go a little bit fast. I wanna make sure that I stop at 15 minutes and give time to uh, the other speakers. Uh, so the, the thing to notice is that about 500 520 patients were excluded, <coughs> and for different reasons, but a majority of them for anatomical uh, reasons. So that's good to, to know that not everybody who came in got randomized, and that becomes important when we talk about uh, whether everybody should have power or something. So it was sort of a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, equal number of randomization, uh, and majority of people once were, were randomized, they went through the uh, um, procedure with very few uh, crossovers. And the follow-up was very good, about 98.4% of patients did follow up. And when they looked at the primary endpoint at the end of the uh, one year, uh, clearly um, TAVOR did better, uh, was non-inferior with very, very robustly, and then it also, importantly enough, met superiority. So clearly, uh, power in this trial was superior to surgery. Uh, mortality, there was a trend, but it did not meet the st statistical significance. But when you look at stroke, uh, it certainly did much better. Very, uh, very early, immediately post-procedure, which was maintained throughout. And then if you take the composite uh, of death or disabling stroke, it clearly did better, power. Um, if you look at subgroup analysis, almost across all subgroups, TAVOR was better. And interestingly enough, a lot less atrial fibrillation, much, much shorter hospital stay, and quality of life based on the Kansas City questionnaire was much better at 30 days. So patients recovered much faster and did much better. And all very, very significant in terms of PFAS. Perhaps surgery can claim one uh, uh, point on having less new left bundle branch block. Um, now, in terms of the valve and its the gradient, mean gradient afterwards, again, TAVOR gave better hemodynamics. The mean gradient was better, and the valve area was better after deployment. And uh, this is sort of what I learned when uh, I started to do TAVOR, the valve area of the surgical valve is not what's written on the, on the valve, it's, it's a lot less. And so with TAVOR, that, that's not the case. So it's obvious you, I mean, it's intuitive, you get better hemodynamics. Um, so what are the limitations? Of course, this is a one year. We don't know what happens down the road. Um, and the results, of course, doesn't apply to the subgroups uh, such as bypass aortic valves people who need alternative access, those patients were not, were excluded. Uh, moving on to the, uh, the other trial that was presented, uh, the Medtronic uh, tri Evolute trial. This trial had a little bit of uh, uh, different uh, endpoint. Uh, basically, uh, the primary endpoint of this was all mortality and disabling stroke as two years. Again, uh, there were a bunch of secondary endpoints, um, as you can see. Uh, but patients were randomized to TAVOR versus SAVOR. Very few crossovers and good follow-ups. The difference though, and, and this is important because the results are a little bit different, is that everybody in partner three got the newest generation of the valve, which was uh, S3. And when this trial started, some of the older generations were put in. Actually, Evolute Pro was only in 
where you have a skirt and you have, you know, it's a better, better definitely improvement on it. Nevertheless, when they looked at um, all-cause mortality and disabling stroke, sorry, uh, there was certainly a trend for uh, TAVR. Mortality, of course, is very hard to show superior mortality, and it did not. But certainly disabling stro uh, stroke was better. And when you look at hospitalizations, again, in line with the previous trial with the Edwards valve, Tower did much better. Hemodynamics, even better than Edwards. Uh, you know, uh, better valve area, and better gradient. Um, and if you look at the 30-day uh, results, pretty much all the yellow yellows are favorable for Tower and the blue is favorable for SAVAR, which is the only one is a pacemaker implant in this trial. And if you look at the subgroup analysis, pretty much uh, the data was consistent to most of the subgroups. Uh, it's, of course, intuitive. Patients did much better in terms of quality of life immediately post-procedure as the mobility is better, people get home faster, and there's not much more morbidity. <coughs> so in summary, uh, the uh, tab over self-expanding supraannular valves was non-inferior to surgery for the primary endpoint, which was death, disabled, and stroke at two years. Not 30 day TAVR showed better safety and recovery profile than surgery with less death and disabling stroke and better quality of life. And at one year, both groups had excellent survival. TAVR showed fewer disabling stroke, heart failure, hospitalization, with superior hemodynamics by lower gradients and larger DOA. So, We've come a long way. Uh, the first TAVR was done in 2002 by Dr. Cuvier right outside Paris on a patient who was not a candidate for surgery because of a lot of um, comorbidities. He did it transeptally, sort of going across his head to do it, but all you need is a pioneer with guts, and you had it in this man who did it, the patient actually did very well with the procedure, but did not make it home. But this was the start, and it was intriguing, and everybody got interested, companies put finances behind it, and now we've come a long way. I showed this slide now in the past five years as where we were and where we used we would go, and I'm glad that I can go all the way through it because we've made it. So there used to be surgery was the only treatment, then surgery, then TAVR showed to be okay in patients who were at high risk for surgery. So surgery was still gold standard treatment for everybody else. Uh, was preferred for low risk and intermediate. Then we showed that TAVR is within this patient population. And now I can tell you that we are at a point where surgery should be performing patients degenerative aortic stenosis who have contradiction to the And this clearly proves that. The only issue that remains is the durability issue. And of course, we're always going to have this issue until we have 10-year data. And the question will remain. However, we have data to show, in my opinion, that it is not an issue. If you look at the partner one trials, and they follow these patients now for five years, there was no signal that there was any worse deterioration with the TAVR valve versus SAVR. Of course, a lot of these patients were very sick and didn't survive to five years, so they started with a, a much bigger number, but those who did, did fairly well. And also, this is from Sartavi, uh, the intermediate risk for metronic, the hemodynamics remain much better on the intermediate risk after two years. Having said that, 
time or uh, some or vows have their own issues. It's not like that they want to deteriorate. This, this just shows three papers, one by my very good friend, college uh, uh, roommate, Moazani, that there are a lot of uh, these valves that deteriorate fast. And if you actually look at the valve in valve registry, a lot of the valves that we put towers in were year three, year four, year five. Actually, the peak of the graph is year seven and eight. And if you look at a lot of these data, a lot different valves, they all deteriorate as well. So in my opinion, there is no signal from the earlier partner and med Medtronic trials to suggest that these valves deteriorate. Surgical valves are by themselves not gold standard as they deteriorate as well. We already have documented better hemodynamics for TAVR at the time of implant, but we will know for sure in five to 10 years. And perhaps pictures are worth a thousand words. The picture on the, my left is old, is about four years old. They did that in Canada just to show that they can. The patient had TAVR in the morning, was walking around, ready to go home in the afternoon. And the picture on the right, is the full soul had his valve done surgery. So uh, with that, uh, I'll go. Yeah. Try to get out of the way here. Unfortunately, the remote doesn't work with my old school non Mac PC. Uh, and I'm going to use some notes. I'm not as smart, of course, as Dr. Yastani, so I need to use a little reminder notes for my presentation. But I wanted to first thank Sean for setting us up and inviting me. Uh, also, thank my colleagues, uh, Dr. Rioma and Dr. Trichiotis from uh, Walter Reed and uh, the VA from being here uh, to help support uh, this presentation. And thanks, Matt, and uh, everybody for uh, help setting this up. Uh, in terms of disclosures, I just did briefly want to say that uh, obviously I am active duty in the military, but my views don't represent the military or the DOD, they're my own uh, alone. Uh, the other disclosure is I am a surgeon, but I participate in SAVR, thanks to the effort of Sean's colleague, G. So, who brought, uh, uh, TAV, brought TAVR to our program uh, about three and a half years ago. And I'm not here to argue that SAVR is superior for all patients. I would argue that it really can't compete across multiple patient groups. I'm an advocate of TAVR. My dad is pushing 80, and uh, if he had severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, he's a low risk patient, I would want him to have TAVR as an option. So uh, that's my disclosure, is I'm not here to tell you that everybody uh, should have heart surgery. I was invited here uh, by Eugene So, and uh, I know you can't really read this all writing, but this is a, a cartoon that said that Daniel's a great guy. That's the most fun I ever had with a person without eating them. <laughs> because he said, hey, Jared, do you want to come and talk about why surgical AVR is superior to TAVR to an audience of cardiologists? And I said, sure, no problem. It fits well because I just gave a talk at CPAC about the Green New Deal, and I was going to go down to uh, uh, Western Mississippi to talk about the uh, automatic weapons ban. Uh, so this, this fits in well with my other initiatives. Uh, but in all seriousness, this question does come up. You know, patients ask this question. It was good for me as a surgeon to examine the evidence, and so I wanted to present some of that. I did want to start by talking about some of the trial results. That's not really my focus today. My focus is to talk about a niche of patients where I believe that surgical ABR is still uh, indicated clearly. But it's worth talking a little bit about the results. Uh, so again, I'm sorry, the font is kind of small here, but I did want to point out TAVR in the S3 trial was associated with a higher rate of major vascular complications, a higher rate of pacemakers, that wasn't significant, but the, the uh, rate of a left bundle branch block was 24% in one year versus 8% with surgery. That is certainly significant. There was a higher risk of moderate or severe perivalvular leak with TAVR in the S3 trial. That didn't mean significance, but what did is there was a much higher rate of a mild perivalvular leak. There was 140 in the TAVR group and 12 in the SAVR group. If we're allowing somebody to have a mild perivalvular leak after AVR, we're setting a new standard because I'll tell you as surgeons, we don't leave the operating room with any perivalvular leak. So that's a question. 
There was a higher rate of coronary obstruction with TAVR. And I would actually uh, contradict one point Dr. Yazdani made. In the S3 trial, there was actually a lower gradient with surgical valves uh, that uh, was significant. Now, that's unusual, and it's different from the other trials. What that tells me, it's not a significant difference, a gradient of 11 versus 12. It tells me it was good surgeons, uh, surgeons that had a low threshold to do a root enlargement, uh, annual enlargement. A lot of the valves were 23 or larger. They did a good job. And if you look at the names of the surgeons, I think Greg and June would agree these are very uh, uh, well-respected leaders in our field. The core valve tri trial, I would point out, there was more moderate or severe aortic regurgitation at 30 days, 3.5 versus 0.5% and a pacemaker rate of 17% versus 6% in the core valve trial. A couple points I wanted to make about the methodology. Again, this isn't my focus, but it's, it's worth mentioning. There are several flaws. One of them is that 26% of the patients who had surgical AVR had another surgical procedure that was indicated at the time of their surgery compared to 8% with TAVR. When you look specifically at revascularization, 58 surgical patients had cabbage, but only 32 TAVR patients had PCI. It speaks to the same point. Are we setting a different standard? These were clearly people who had ischemia in ischemic territory. It was treated with surgery, not treated for whatever reason within the TAVR group. And perhaps a bigger point, the primary endpoint was a combined endpoint of death, stroke, and rehospitalization. This is not a good endpoint. We can't equate rehospitalization in a year with death or stroke. It's not in the same category whatsoever. And in fact, it's interesting, a lot of the trial results, you have to look in the supplement. But if you dig through the supplement, if you take the patients who did not have a concomitant procedure, they had straight surgical ADR compared to straight TAVR, okay? There was no significant difference in death or stroke, okay? And uh, what drove the differences in that combined endpoint is rehospitalization. So this is an important thing to understand about the trial. It was really methodologically flawed. And talking to some of the people who are involved in planning, this was a source of controversy. I, I do disagree with that methodology. And I would say, in general, there's very much a rust of judgment uh, and FDA approval for the lowest indication. In fact, I would say TAVR is already being employed uh, in some uh, low-risk patients. It remains to be seen, I think, whether it's even equivalent uh, for low-risk patients. And I have a picture of two valves there. And uh, one is the Toronto stentless porcine valve, and one is the MitroFlow. You're probably familiar with these because you're probably doing a lot of TAVRs on these patients. The point is, these are two surgical AVRs that look great until they didn't, until they all started falling apart, and now guess what? You know, we don't use them anymore. So durability is a potential concern. But my main point today is, irrespective of durability, irrespective of the long-term results of Partner 3, there are some situations where, where a surgical AVR is indicated regardless. <coughs> Durability really is a question and really is a concern. It's not just fake news. The TAVR leaflets are actually thinner. I didn't know that until I prepared for this discussion. They're thinner than the ones used on our surgical tissue valves. They are more prone to mechanical stress-related damage. The references are here. These are histopathologic studies under a microscope. They've shown that during crimping, there are crude cracks in the glutaraldehyde, which is the layer that helps uh, protect the valve. They've done microscopy of the crimp valves and showed fragmented collagen fibers, and that's after a single crimping. What about a core valve that's been retrieved and deployed several times? That's an unknown. And they've also shown that native valve calcification actually may protrude inside the stent. So it's possible that someday they're gonna find a skeleton and it's gonna have a sternotomy, and just like when they found a, a skull with a trepanation hole in it, they're gonna wonder what the heck we're doing. But I don't think so. I think surgical AVR is here to stay, uh, at least for the near future. I want to talk about some of the reasons why. So bicuspid valve patients are an important one to discuss, and they were excluded from all of the partner trials. They represent only 1% to 2% of our population, but upwards of 20% of our AVRs are bicuspid patients. And they were excluded for good reasons. They're not good for TAVR. Uh, the initial data suggested they weren't good for a number of reasons. Fused Rafe with variable calcification, asymmetric cusps, eccentric annulus, calcification of the LBOT, it's associated with aortopathy and aortic root dilation. And as a result of that, uh, the selection of the appropriate size is more challenging. There are higher rates of perivalvular leak, particularly with Sieverts type one and type two, which are depicted in the upper right, more pacemakers and a higher risk for annular rupture. With additional experience by cuspid valves, we have better understanding of the morphology. We're better able to size. We now know we need to avoid overexpansion in these patients. Uh, the design improvements, the skirt that's been developed in the latest generation of devices, learning the implantation 
technique, critical importance of more cranial and positioning. And with all the studies suggesting that there are acceptable results with tower in bicuspid valve patients. I'll spare you from the details of these two studies, but they basically showed equivalent mortality rates in bicuspid versus tricuspid tabor. However, there's other studies that suggest differently. This first study basically compared bicuspid to tricuspid. There was no significant difference in mortality, but there was a high rate of interprocedural bailout in tabor. There was a reduction in the success rate. This study was a meta-analysis of nine studies comparing bicuspid versus tricuspid tabor. And the TAVR had a higher rate of moderate to severe paravalvular leak in a bicuspid valve, a 5.5 odds ratio of conversion to surgery, and a ratio of success of 0.6, all statistically significant. And this is a radiographic study, CT guided, that showed higher rates of, of device in expansion at the mid sinus level and below the sinus, in addition to the outflow tract. And so I would say we have to be very careful about applying TAVR to bicuspid valve, particularly for longer patients and as younger patients, and especially for those with unfavorable anatomy, including calcified ref A or dilated descending aorta. The best data we have is from the TAVR bicuspid valve registry. And what this study initially did is confirm that the outcomes are better with newer generation valves in bicuspid patients. But we have more recent data, and I want, wanted to highlight some of this data. These were patients only assessed with new generation devices compared with old generation devices. I apologize, these graphics are a little bit hard to see. But on the bottom is new generation devices. On the far right, bicuspid in orange and tricuspid in blue. And you can see the pacemaker rate, 16% and 18%. Absence of device success in bicuspid valve, new generation of 5%. I would just tell you, as a surgeon, if these were my results, I'd be looking for another job, and my consultants would probably be sending my patients to a different uh, surgeon. On the right-hand side, I want to point out in red is patients with a bicuspid valve and calcified ref A. The upper graph on the far right is sapien 3 valve, high rate of annulus rupture, 2.3%. This is new generation devices. On the bottom left, perivalvular leak with a core valve with calcified ref A, almost 30%. So given a patient with bicuspid valve and calcified ref A, you're choosing between a device with a high rate of annular rupture or a high rate of perivalvular leak. So I would avoid TAVR for calcified ref A. I would certainly use it with caution with any ref A, and particularly for younger patients, we have no intermediate or long-term comparative data. And we have contemporary studies with contemporary devices that show higher rates of conversion to surgery, higher rates of perivalvular leak, lower rates of success, and an increased risk of a pacemaker for bicuspid patients. The second category is very young, and I'm no physicist, but I'll contend that this particular device, which is a mechanical ABR, will never fit in either one of these devices. Now, I know mechanical valves are very unpopular in this day and age, and that's being driven in part by TAVR, but I would point out the current ACC AHI guidelines, class 2A, recommend a mechanical valve for patients less than 50. Same thing in the European guidelines. Mechanical valve is recommended for patients less than 60. This doesn't really reflect our current practice, but this wasn't arbitrary. This is based on evidence, and there's certainly no evidence to suggest that all of a sudden we should throw these guidelines away and discard mechanical valves forever. In fact, again, I'm, in the interest of time, I'll skip through this quickly, but what we know is that bioprosthetic valves are clearly associated with a higher rate of reoperation, higher rate of valve failure, and similar survival. Perhaps the biggest study, recent study, that may, some of you may be familiar with, New England Journal of Medicine. This is from uh, California data. Almost 10,000 patients undergoing isolated ABR, 15,000 undergoing isolated mitral valve replacement. And what they found is that bioprosthetic ABR patients had a higher mortality. Same thing with mitral valve. Higher mortality with bioprosthetic, not with mechanical valves. What they found also that's important is over the course of this study between 96 and 2013, the use of bioprosthetics went from 12% to 50% for the aortic valve, and from 17% to 54%, really in the absence of data. So the current trend toward the use of biological valves in young patients may need to be re-examined. It's often predicated on the idea that well, we'll put in a TAVR later when your uh, biological valve fails. But Valve and valve procedures currently are associated with mortality risk of up to 8%. The valve and valve registry showed a 15% rate of malposition of the device, a 4% rate of coronary osteoobstruction, and higher gradients. And certainly unknown durability. 
I just went back and looked at my data. Who have I actually put a mechanical valve in the aortic position recently? A 25-year-old bicuspid male with severe AI cardiomyopathy, a 19-year-old bicuspid valve, 23-year-old. Yeah, obviously we're at Walter Reed. Our patient population may be different than the population at large. Do we really think that a, bio, a prosthetic valve is the right answer for most of these patients, or a TAVR when they're age 19 or 25 or 26? Or a 49-year-old had a fam, failing bioprosthetic valve and didn't want to have to worry about that ever again? So I would argue that there may still be a, a patient population who benefits from a mechanical valve that will never be achievable with a transcatheter solution. The next thing is patients who have dilation of the aortic root in the proximal ascending aorta. It's present up to 50% of bicuspid aortic valve patients. It was initially thought to be due to their uh, underlying pathology of aortic stenosis. We now know better. We know it's a microscopic condition. Even people that have a bicuspid valve that is functioning well have abnormal fibrillin and metallic metal proteinases in their tissue, seen in both the aortic and the pulmonic valves. And if it's not addressed, it's associated with an annual risk of rupture, dissection, or aortic rate of death greater than 14% for somebody with an aorta greater than six centimeters. This is IRAD data. It's not addressed by TAVR. And oh, by the way, the dilated root and aortopathy, often associated with aortic valve disease, can make uh, the complexity of TAVR higher. There's conflicting data on the fate of the aorta after AVR. But we are starting to see cases of patients who have a transcatheter valve and come in with an aortic dissection later. So I would contend that surgery still holds an advantage for somebody with a dilated aortic root or ascending aorta. It can't be addressed at the time of TAVR. How about patients who have a compelling indication for cabbage? Uh, studies to date, they've really been excluded. Uh, and in the TAVR trials, they're often not treated or treated with concomitant PCI. Uh, I think we need to consider this group. There's a group of patients who have an independent survival benefit from cabbage who also have aortic stenosis. People with distal left main disease, complex multivessel disease, particularly diabetics. There's somebody that may not, some patients that may not have a survival benefit from cabbage over PCI, but have a more favorable long-term success rate in terms of revascularization. Those with osteocircumflex disease, for example, in which case uh, PCI is not necessarily a durable solution. This is just a chart showing the incidence of significant coronary disease uh, in patients who had surgical AVR. You can see it's 71 years or higher, almost 50% also required concomitant cabbage. And it's present in 65% of patients over the age of 80 who have severe aortic stenosis. Keep in mind that cabbage at the time of AVR for significant coronary stenosis is a class one recommendation, both AHA and European guidelines, but all these patients were excluded from the partner trials. Nobody in those trials nor those in Sirtavi were included if they had left main disease or complex coronary disease. That's an important limitation. But what about valve and valve TAVR? So that, again, that's talked about as the solution. When the TAVR fails, we'll put in a, another TAVR. When the surgical AVR fails, we'll put in a TAVR. It, you know, the valve and valve registry, first of all, I would point out that is not a good surrogate for the lifetime expectancy of a, of a surgical valve because it's inherently biased, right? You're taking valves that have failed surgical valves that have failed in that registry, so it's a very small subpopulation of our tissue valves. It does show it's safe and feasible, but it also shows consistently higher gradients and higher rates of pacemaker. It's certainly not appropriate for smaller surgical valves, and if we're really going to apply that as a prospective strategy for the young patient who's having a surgical AVR, and we're going to tell a 25-year-old, we'll do a surgical AVR, and don't worry, we'll put a TAVR when it wears out. It requires a thoughtful approach. It requires a surgeon that's going to put in a large enough valve, at least a 23, ideally a 25 or greater, that will support an adequately sized transcatheter device. This is just an example. This is a guy I just saw this week, and uh, he had a previous 21 millimeter tissue valve, and his coronary height of 6 millimeters. So, you know, is this patient a good candidate for a valve and valve TAVR? I would say not. Uh, and we see this very often. Aortic valve repair is worth at least mentioning. Uh, typically, this is a patient with a bicuspid valve who's undergoing aortic root aneurysm repair, uh, and it may have a role, especially for patients that are very young. Once again, not an option with a transcatheter valve approach. And there are other anatomic considerations. Again, most of these things were excluded from the partner trials. What about the patients with heavy LV outflow tract calcium, as depicted here, low coronary heights, defaced aortic sinuses? All these people were typically excluded from the trials because they're very high risk for TAVR. For surgical AVR, these really aren't issues at all, aren't factors, and don't make our operation any higher risk. Endocarditis, this is my favorite slide because it's only one word. Endocarditis, that's all you have to say. There's no transcatheter solution. It's my partner, June, is fond of saying, we'll always have endocarditis. Don't worry, Jerry. <laughs> 
So I hope I've convinced you that SAVR is certainly still relevant, particularly by custom patients, very young patients. Surgical AVR should be strongly considered, those with an aortic aneurysm. Those with degenerative bioprosthetic valves, especially with a small valve size and or low coronaries. Those with complex coronary disease. Patients with other anatomic considerations, such as a bulky LV output tract calcium, and patients with endocarditis. And I believe for the foreseeable future, irrespective of the long-term results of part three, these patients are better treated with surgical AVR. I also think that independent of all these considerations, if the FDA is to approve TAVR for a low-risk indication based on short-term data, it should be age-based. Uh, so I would make a strong argument, and this is generally the practice in Europe as well already, if somebody's going to have a low-risk TAVR, it should be over the age of 70 to 75, because we have complete absence of data for younger patients, and we have absolutely no mid-term or long-term results. So I hope I've convinced you that it's not quite time to send your cardiac surgeon out to the past year yet. Uh, I wanted to again uh, thank you, uh, Sean, for the opportunity to present today, and I would echo your sentiments uh, that we too have a really strong uh, team-based approach at Walter Reed, working with our colleagues there. Uh, we really do value that, and I would agree with your sentiments that you know we really do believe the two therapies are complementary. Uh, that the patient in the end is the winner when we get together in a hard team approach. We truly consider uh, both options and we decide what's best for any given patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anthony, for the great presentation and certainly uh, you made a lot of good points and uh, Dr. Atkins now is going to hopefully show us some um, CT um, images that will complement your talk as where we have to make decisions regarding one therapy or the other. A quick question. Um, do you feel that we should have a um, head-to-head uh, -head, uh, trial for TAVOR versus SAVOR for bicuspid valve, or should we just rely on the registries that are ongoing right now? Yeah, I think the registries are highly imperfect data. Uh, so I think if we're truly to offer, start offering uh, TAVR and bicuspid valve patients absolutely should be dependent upon data from a trial. I think there's fairly strong evidence from the re registries that TAVR is inferior to bicuspid valve patients, so I don't think we should change our practice without prospective randomized data. Uh, sounds good. Uh, as you know, we, we are doing a lot of TAVR in uh, intermediate risks with uh, bicuspid, and the technique is getting better. We're deploying it more cranially and um, uh, the skirt certainly has improved the per leak, but there's no question that the pacemaker rate still is an issue in this group of population. And uh, sir, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I think unless we have a head-to-head -head comparison, we are always gonna have that uh, doubt. And just to echo one point that Dr. Atkins may mention, you know, not all bicuspid valves are created equal. You know, bicuspid Siebert zero versus Siebert two with calcified refe. I think we're learning that they're a very heterogeneous population. Some actually may be very amenable. Siebert zero, non-calcified, no rafe, might be very good for TAVR, but you can't lump that patient with a young patient. Siebert two, heavy calcium. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, al there's also like two or three um, transcatheter aortic valves that are in, in uh, IDE or experimental or trials right now that are specifically focused for the bicuspid. So, distribution of leaflet graphes, uh, length of calcification is extremely different. And, and, uh, I think the short term and the limitations we see with the transcatheter valves are clearly that anatomical constraint. No doubt, no doubt. Well, without further ado. For those of you who don't know, I'm Melanie Atkins. I'm the Director of Cardiac Imaging at Fairfax Radiology. Um, I'm going to go over some cases, uh, discuss some images, and uh, every week we sit down and have this discussion as TAVR versus SAVR, and so I'm just going to go through a few case examples of, uh, of how we make this decision. Uh, I like to put this slide at the beginning of every structural heart disease conversation because we do do a lot of imaging. Um, imaging is, is exceedingly important in structural heart disease, both with CT and MR after the fact. Today we're just talking about um, TAVR planning up in the upper left-hand corner, um, but we do many other things uh, in the world of cardiac imaging. So 
Um, just as a reminder, preoperative anatomic imaging is, is completely uh, is, is completely necessary for um, preoperative imaging for TAVR. Uh, we need angular sizing, coronary height evaluation. We'll talk about a problem with that in, in a little bit. Um, evaluate the annular calcification. Um, certainly bicuspid valves are a big conversation um, that we'll show a case of. Aneurysm, I'm not gonna talk about access, although access is an issue, and when we started uh, TAVR a few years ago, um, we, we sent patients to surgery for access problems, but we have so many alternative access options at this, at this stage of the game. Um, and a lot of these actually come up in our higher risk patients that are really not surgical candidates anyways. So we really have so many options uh, with transcable, transcarotid at this point, but this is somewhat taken out of the, the issue um, in the TAVR versus SAVR um, conversation. So anatomic imaging, obviously CTA is preferred. Um, I used to talk about renal insufficiency a lot in patients. Um, newer recommendations from the ACR have come out that, that a GFR of 30 is really safe for idoneated contrast. Um, and, and probably less, there's every year when we go to RSNA, which is our big radiology conference, there's a, a similar argument like this, does contrast nephropathy actually exist? So depending on which side uh, you're on, you can really image all these patients now safely with, with CTA. Uh, MRI also is an option. Uh, we do it in our facility um, infrequently, but um, certainly is, is an option. So we're gonna go through five cases, uh, examples um, that we, that are, are from our TAVR clinic. And uh, sorry about that. So the first case is a 72-year-old uh, male patient. He's an active, uh, low-risk patient um, that we sent actually for a partner three evaluation. Um, and, and he actually didn't want surgery. He's a farmer and so didn't want to take off any time. Um, he had um, severe aortic stenosis, so he came in for a TAVR workup. So here's his preoperative uh, CTA. Things are looking good so far. He's um, an adequate size. He's got nice sized coronaries. He's got a tri uh, calcified tri leaflet valve. But then he went for cath and he had um, segmental LAD traversing a, a big D2 that was going to be a very difficult uh, percutaneous intervention. He also had, in that large caliber D2, he had an 80% stenosis that um, was FFR and found to be significant. So in, in that, um, Breath, he, he underwent AVR and two vessel cabbage actually just a few weeks ago, and um, he's, he's done well postoperatively. The next patient is an 81 year old patient, uh, intermediate risk uh, with severe AS. He has a history of pulmonary fibrosis, which is part of, he's otherwise a, a healthier guy, but the pulmonary fibrosis and whatnot increased his STS score. Um, and so he was sent for preoperative TAVR CTA. Um, as you can see here at top left, he is a, um, he's a tri-leaflet valve. He's got a dilated root um, at the sinuses. Uh, his major problem though is he's got a 5.4 centimeter ascending aortic aneurysm. And um, after he was, um, again, signed up for partner, or you know, he was an intermediate risk patient, I'm sorry, but um, he ended up going on to have uh, surgery because of his um, ascending aortic aneurysm and because his valve is too big. So he, um, we have a area here of 895, almost 900, and um, a perimeter of 110. So I'm sorry this doesn't project very well, but we now know that we can add um, into both Sapien 3 and um, Evolute valves. We can we can um, post dilate. However, there is a problem with aortic insufficiency in these patients, um, and this gentleman having um, an annulus of 900 basically and a, a perimeter of 110 he was sent for surgery. The unfortunate about, part about this guy is um, so he had a great surgery he also had AFib so they did a maze and a left atrial appendage resection at the same time he did very well but he arrested a couple days after leaving rehab but he didn't make it through his surgery um, even on his, his risk level. Uh, another low risk patient um, that we uh, saw as a workup of partner three um, again, severe aortic stenosis, didn't want surgery as well. Um, and his CT demonstrated a bicuspid aortic valve. You can see here we're in a systolic phase with the valve open, but he does have um, a calcified wrap day as well. He also um, has an ascending aortic aneurysm of um, 4.5 centimeters. So we ended up sending him for surgery. He did very well. He got a, um, an aorta reconstruct, ascending aortic reconstruction and a, and a surgical valve. 
Our next um, patient is actually quite a young patient who has worked up for partner three. Um, she's an active, uh, low-risk patient. She was deferred because of a heavy, heavily calcified valve. Um, it was asymmetric and actually extended into the annulus um, and down into the left ventricular outflow tract. Um, so these, these patients um, with heavily calcified valves were, as, as, as mentioned previously, were excluded from partner three. Um, and she also, at the same time, had a 5.2 centimeter aneurysm. Um, so again, she went on for an aortic valve replacement and an um, ascending reconstruction. So the last patient uh, is an intermediate risk patient um, who was referred for TAVR, uh, sent for CTA um, to evaluate. And you can see here has a 6.9 millimeter left coronary height. Um, it's a tri-leaflet valve, um, otherwise sizing looks good. Um, and as an intermediate risk patient, she was actually um, signed up for Basilica. Um, and so this patient went on to um, referred for TAVR and she underwent uh, Basilica prior to um, her transcatheter valve and she did well afterwards. So um, as I think all of these things have been mentioned, so I don't want to belabor the point. Um, Certainly every week, the conversation that we have is trying to find the people that we, we think need to be referred to surgery versus the people that we think are, um, are um, TAVR candidates. And um, these are just a couple examples of kind of our decision-making tree and, and how we come up with, with these decisions. Thank you very much. Um, any questions, comments? Um, what is our threshold for uh, aortic size or aortic root size for TAVR? <clears throat> what is the largest uh, aortic root that we can do TAVR? Oh, you mean the aortic uh, annulus? No, the uh, ascending oh, aortic. Ascending aortic. So, so that's the point of actually <laughs> discussion, right? Discussion. So um, if you talk to my surgical colleagues, uh, 4.5, that if you see in isolation, we watch, uh, they would, some of, at least some of, my colleagues, my institution say, well, you know, 4.5 is gonna get there if it's associated also with aortic stenosis, then you might wanna take the whole thing. As opposed to a cardiologist who might say, well, I'm gonna watch the 4.5 and take care of the aortic valve there. So that, that, those are the type of discussions that we'll have, but I think um, a lot of these dilated aortic uh, aneurysms are associated with bicuspid valve, which also makes the decision a little easier as which route to go right now. Um, so I definitely not will not push necessarily for TAVR in this patient population. Um, I think that the, 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 the point was actually to, the point, the, the, we made the talk as TAVR has arrived and should be offered to everybody. But I think the sentiment, and I agree with that sentiment, is that it is a teamwork and actually a lot of patients still will benefit from surgery over TAVR even though I think TAVR clearly now has a role in low risk patients. And I do agree, especially when you get into, I'm gonna say 65 years and older. <laughs> but um, I don't know what you think. Uh, no, I think we're on the same page. Uh, again, I'm, I'm an advocate of TAVR. We, uh, we see it every day, both are outstanding. But it's not for everybody. And I think surgery's not going away for a significant proportion of our patients. And you know, I, I don't think the data support uh, Tavern and low risk at age 65, not yet. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, it's anticipated FDA clearance could come as soon as this fall. It'll be interesting to see if there's an age stipulation. I've spoken with a couple of the physicians at the FDA, including one who's in charge of devices, and they're very thoughtful about it. Um, and they're trying to balance the idea that there may be a therapy out there that could save lives or be more effective. They don't want to withhold that from patients versus the unknown durability and safety. So. I was impressed in talking to him and the FDA that they have a very much thoughtful process in considering this new technology. I think what is really clearly beneficial in structural heart therapy, this is different than coronary uh, therapy, is that it is a team effort. So if, if we do have a, a different point of view, there will be a discussion made and somebody is gonna make their point as opposed to coronary uh, artery disease where it's a one, one person decision with the patient, but really the cardiologist, and, and it goes both ways. You know, I, we have cardiologists who 
don't want to do complex PCI, um, send it for surgery, and you look at it, well, you know, this patient also has a lot of comorbidity. So it's not always to the cardiologist benefit, but if you do have the same team approach in coronary artery disease, I think you'll do a lot better. We do have that in, in this therapy, and I think that's really a, an advantage. Certainly, I mean, I have no argument against that. I think, though, when you talk about cabbage uh, AVR, um, also we have coronary artery disease and we have coronary artery disease. If somebody has an isolated, you know, I don't know, mid LAD uh, type A lesion, you know, I think we'll do very well with a, a short stent and then TAVR. But again, that's where the team approach comes in and yep. the discussion will be made. And I, I, I have seen the new recommendations. I think it's great that the team approach stays. I, I'm also very happy to see that we are not gonna require two surgeons because that has, you know, at least in my institution, has caused a bottleneck. Uh, and, and it really is unnecessary because a surgeon and a cardiologist can discuss and make a decision. You know, it's, I have not yet seen that two surgeons differ in their opinion, so. Um, Another, another interesting discussion point is I think the, the younger group, and I say younger, I say less than 70, and we can say isolated ADR, that's fine for the sake of discussion. You know, they're a, they're a more discernible patient group than those who are 80. And when they come in and have the discussion, at least with the surgeon, I don't know what they necessarily have with the structural heart intervention cardiologists, but you know, the, the one key element in the discussion that comes in is that when we talk to them about the distinguishing features between transcatheter and surgical aortic valve, besides the heart lung machine and, and that part of the recovery, the other element is we completely excise the disease in the valve. And you know, we put a, you know, a, new, a new valve in versus the transcatheter where you know, the disease and the elements are still staying in and you're stenting it. And you know, that, that is a very you know, important feature to the, the discussion point I've had a majority of patients under 70 who, who, who want it out. Just, that's it. They, they do not like the fact that that element is staying in the body. I did want to highlight one point for the younger patients, especially if you start to extend to low risk younger patients. You've got to be very careful not to set a different standard for therapy. You know, I made the point about a very high rate of, of a, a mild perivalvular leak in the tavern data in Parker 3. You know, surgery, that's not our standard. It's an unknown. Mild perivalvular leak, generally, I think it's not clinically, it's clinically significant, but we don't know. 
some of these perivalve releases get larger, and then their patients are back in five years. You're trying to figure out how you can safely get an AMPLAS device. It's different in these patients when they're 65, 70, and healthy than the patients we're used to dealing with. Just like when you have to put a pacemaker in a 65 year old, it's a very diff a different implication than putting a pacemaker in an 85 year old. So, and just like when you're not worried about some coronary disease in the, in the CERC system, it's a different standard when you're talking about younger, otherwise healthy people. And so I think we have to be careful that we don't let our standards slide uh, because the availability of the, a, a catheter-based therapy that's less invasive. Well, I think, uh, you know, the good news is that both uh, Evolute and uh, Coordinate 3 trial, they are going to follow patients up to 10 years. So we will have, in the next nine years, we will, we will know exactly what happened to this patient. That will not uh, take uh, away the fact that all these patients are over 65 years of age. So I think the, what happens in the younger population is, is certainly a good point. Um, but in the next 10 years, we'll, we'll see uh, whether the benefit, which I think there was some benefit, especially with one of the drugs, <coughs> Uh, superiority um, will will last uh, longer. Um, in the patient population that we have tr uh, treated, the mild perivalvular leak has not been an issue. And um, I, when I have my discussion, I have not had a discussion whether calcium leaving in or not leaving in is an issue. And nobody has told me that that's an issue. I think it's how am I going to do in 10 years, in the next 10 years with different therapies that Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Thank you, Dr. Anthony.